Welcome back. In this, the fourth of my series of updates I'm doing on my 2017 data updates, I'd like to talk about country risk. There was a time not that long ago where if you're an analyst in a country, you could focus just on the country you were in and forget about the rest of the world. And this was especially true for the U.S., where analysts could afford to be inward looking and forget about the rest of the world. Those days are over. Today, if you're an analyst, an investor, anywhere in the world, you have to be aware not just of your domestic numbers, but of what's happening in the rest of the world. Let me take a simple example. Let's assume you're a U.S. analyst looking at a company like Coca-Cola or ExxonMobil or a European analyst looking at Nestle. You're going to find that even though these might be developed market companies in terms of where they're incorporated, they get significant exposure to emerging markets because their revenues are in these markets. Conversely, if you're an Indian analyst looking at Tata Consulting Services or Infosys or a Brazilian analyst looking at Embraer, you have to be aware of the rest of the world because these companies have significant developed market exposure. I think it is almost impossible to do corporate finance and valuation without having perspective on how risk varies across the globe. So let me start off with a couple of very basic propositions. The first one is that your risk exposure as a company is determined not by where you're incorporated, but where you do business. I think the sloppy way of just looking at a company's incorporation and attaching country risk to it is that no longer works. The second proposition is that country risk, as it varies across countries, will affect your value. You might say that's self-evidence, but look at the, let's look at the mechanics by which country risk enters value. Let's go back and set up a basic discounted cash flow view of the world. You've expected cash flows in the numerator and a discount rate in the denominator. For country risk to affect value, it has to affect one or the other. I'm going to divide country risk into two groups. Some country risk is more company and country specific. In other words, it's very specific to that country. It doesn't affect the rest of the countries in the world. That kind of risk, especially if you're a global investor, is going to show up only in expected cash flows. Let me give you a specific example. Let's assume you're investing in a country where there's significant nationalization risk. That is significant risk, but it's risk that is specific to that country. Let's say there's a 20% chance your company will be nationalized. When you do your valuation, you do your expected cash flows, your expected cash flows will have to reflect that likelihood of nationalization and how much it's going to lower value. Your expected cash flows will be much lower. That obviously will lower value. Some country risk, though, is country risk that is not just specific to the country, but cuts across countries. The way I think about it is when you have a global shock to the system, some countries seem to be more impacted than others. That kind of country risk affects both the expected cash flows for the same reason that nationalization does and the discount rate. So those kinds of risks are actually much more damaging because your expected cash flows are lowered by the, by the ex expectation of that risk and your discount rates have to be increased to reflect that country risk. That might sound like double counting to some of you, but it's not. When you adjust the expected cash flows for the likelihood that something bad will happen, like nationalization, that's what is always supposed to do. You've not risk adjusted the cash flows. To risk adjust the cash flows, you have to adjust the discount rate. And that risk adjustment with country risk has to show up either as a higher equity risk premium in computing cost of equity or as a higher default spread when you're borrowing money. So let's think about ways of measuring country risk. The oldest measure of country risk, the one that's been used the longest, is a measure of default risk. It's sovereign ratings. And there are lots of ratings agencies that rate countries around the world. You have S&P, you have Moody's, you have Fitch. On this particular page, I've actually looked at the ratings for countries across the world. And like companies, countries are rated from AAA all the way down to, uh, to C. Just as with companies, these ratings are supposed to measure default risk. But here are the differences. With sovereign ratings, which is what these are called, you will have two ratings for most countries. A local currency rating, this is the default risk that the ratings agency sees in you when you borrow in the local currency, and a foreign currency rating. A rating, a risk that the, uh, the ratings agency sees in you when you go out and borrow money in a foreign currency. So if Brazil borrows money in dollars, the foreign currency rating applies. When it bor borrows money in rias, the local currency rating applies. The problem, of course, with ratings is they're alphabetical. So if I can't put this into a discount rate because it's not a number. Now, obviously, the simple fix to this is to take the rating and convert into a default spread. And that's one way you can approach viewing country risk is purely from a default risk perspective, taking the ratings agency's measures of default risk and taking them as given. The problem with ratings agencies, of course, is they're often late to the table and they, are, they don't always get ratings right. They're not timely. 
So one very simple proxy for country risk is, and still staying within the default risk realm, is the default spread that you compute by looking at bonds issued by that country. Now, this works only if the country in question issues bonds in dollars or euros. We can compare the rate on that bond to something that you view as risk free. So here's an example. I found a, a bunch of 10-year bonds. You know, many of them are Latin American, but a few non-Latin American countries as well. And I found the, uh, these are dollar-denominated bonds. I found an interest rate at which these bonds were trading. So let's take an example. Brazil's 10-year dollar-denominated bond is a 5.08% interest rate. This is a current market rate. It's based on the pricing of these bonds. On that very same day, January 1st of 2017, the U.S. 10-year T-bond rate was 2.45%. They're both dollar bonds. If I take the difference, I get a difference of 2.63%. That is my default spread for Brazil. Of course, these are based. this works only because I dollar-denominated bonds for Brazil. I could not compare a nominal RI-denominated bond to a U.S. dollar bond and get anything of substance. So these are measures of default risk that you obtain from government bonds. The advantage of this approach as opposed to using a rating is it is a market set number, but it's available only for a small subset of countries around the world. Which brings me to a third approach, which is another market set number of more recent vintage with our sovereign CDS spreads. Sovereign credit default swap spreads are basically insurance that you buy against default risk. They state in annual terms. So as an example, if you took Brazil, you can look up the sovereign CDS for Brazil, and what you get as a number will be the amount that you'll have to pay each year to protect against default risk. So think of this as a measure of default spread. It's current. It's market updated. It is volatile, like all market numbers do, but it's 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 available for about 60 plus countries, and you see them on this page, and you can get the more detailed list if you want in the spreadsheet that is you know that is available on my website. So this is the third measure of country risk. So you got sovereign ratings, you got government default spreads if your country has d government bonds denominated in dollars or euros, and you have sovereign CDS spreads. They're all measures of default risk. Let's build on this now. To get beyond default risk, and you could argue that default risk is a very narrow vision of country risk, you have to bring in all the other risk you worry about in the country. Now, that's tough to do, but there are services that wrestle with this question and come up with country risk scores. One of the, my favorite services is called Political Risk Services, PRS. It's a Europe-based Europe um, service, and it assesses a country risk score for about 140 countries. Their risk scores go from high to low. So a high risk score means that you're a safe country. I know it's a little counterintuitive. And a low risk score means you're a risky country. And they update these scores over the course of the year. They were pretty comprehensive scores. They have more than just default risk in them. But there, you can already see one of the problems with country risk scores is they're not standardized. So if I gave you the country risk score for PRS, by itself it will tell you nothing because you have nothing to compare it to. And if I give you other services that measure country risk, the Economist does, the World Bank does it, each has their own way of measuring country risk. But it, is, it has the advantage of bringing in more than just default risk. Now, the challenge, of course, I face in valuation is these are all nice, that you can get measures of default risk, you can measure, get a measure of country risk. But ultimately, what I want is a number, a number I can use in valuation. So I think about country risk premiums all the time. And there are two basic ways in which people try to come up with equity risk premiums for individual mm -hmm. countries. The standardized approach, the one that many investment banks use, is to start with a base premium, usually for the U.S., and then add to it the default spread that we talked about, either based on a rating or on a sovereign CDS or even based on a government bond. So if you take the 2.63% default spread that we came up for Brazil using the government bond, and if you take that as your measure of default risk for Brazil, here's what you would do to come up with an equity risk premium for Brazil. You'd start with your base premium for the U.S. Let's say it's 6%. You'd add the 2.63% for it, and you'd say, I'm done. My equity risk premium for Brazil is 8.63%. Now, one of my problems with this approach is you are assuming that the default spread on a government bond issued by a country is a good measure of the additional risk premium I would demand for investing in the equity in the country. Intuitively, it seemed to me that equity is riskier than a government bond, that if I'm demanding a 2.63% default spread for Brazil, I should be demanding a larger spread for its equity. So I have developed this approach. I, I wouldn't say derived it because it's just deep thinking. It's just a con it, and it's, it's an approximation where I take the default spread for a country and I scale it up. Scale it up for what the additional risk of equity in this market. 
Now, the way I come up with this is I look up two numbers. The standard deviation and equity index in the market. Let's take Brazil. Let's I'd use the Bovespa. And the standard deviation, the government bond in the market. So let's take Brazil as an example. You have a 2.63% default spread. Let's say that the government bond from which I got the default spread is a standard deviation of 15%. But Brazilian equities have a standard deviation of 30%. They're twice as risky. Then I'm going to multiply the 2.63% by 2, scaling it up. I get 5.26%. I would add that 5.26% to my mature market premium, a U.S. premium, to come up with an equity risk premium for Brazil. Now, of course, this approach requires that you get standard deviations for the country in both the equity market and the bond market, and that can be a little messy, as I've, as I've found in the years that I've had to update the number. Partly because in many countries, you might have a government bond, which, but the government bond is not trade. In many other countries, you don't even have a government bond. So I've used an approximation for the last couple of years that I think works well for me. And here's what I do. I start with estimating an equity risk premium for the U.S. market. And if you remember a couple of, you know, from a couple of sessions ago, that number at the start of 2017 on January 1st of 2017 was 5.69%. I make the assumption that that, that number is a mature market premium. And you say, how do you decide a mature market? I cheat. I look at the sovereign ratings. If you're a AAA rated country, I treat you as a mature market and give you the same equity risk premium that I estimated for the U.S., 5.69%. If your rating is not AAA, if it's lower than AAA, then my work is cut out for me. I come up with a default spread for your country, either using your rating or using a government bond or a sovereign CDS. And then I use it as my starting point for estimating an equity risk premium for your country. So here's what I used to do to get the ratio of equity market risk to bond market risk. Rather than going to each country and look up the government bond and the equity index in that country, which, as I said, is difficult to do and really messy, I compute the, uh, the standard deviation in an emerging market equity index. This is a, you know, one of those broad index funds where you can invest in that invest across emerging market stocks. And I divert, divide that standard deviation by the standard deviation in an emerging market bond a government bond index basically i'm using these these portfolios now to kind of get over the problem that i can't get individual markets and that ratio in january 2017 was 1.23 now this might sound like a bludgeon approach but i take the default spread for each country that i've estimated based on the rating of the cds and i multiply by 1.23 to come up with the additional risk premium for that country you add that on to the 5.69 percent you have an equity risk premium for each country now, this gets me to about 147 countries. I still have about 20 countries for which I cannot get a rating or a default spread, in which case I can't even use this approach. Until about three years ago, I used to ignore these companies, but that's not fair because there are people in these countries who have to make decisions. So here's what I've taken to doing. I took those PRS risk scores that I talked about, and they're available for many of these countries. And I made an approximation. I found other countries with roughly the same PRS score, which had a rating and for which I could get a risk premium. And I attached risk premiums to these frontier markets, markets without default spreads, by looking at other countries which had similar PRS scores. I know I'm stretching, but now I have a risk premium by country. So here's what the world looks to me at the start of 2017. And you can, again, get the explicit numbers by visiting my website. So the green parts of this map are the safest parts of the world. You've got the USA, Canada. Many of these are AAA rated or close to AAA rated. As the equity risk premium increases, you start to see the greens become slightly less green, then they turn yellow, then they turn slightly pink, and then they become red. And you notice that Africa has a lot of risky countries. No surprise there. Asia is surprisingly becoming safer. China seems to have made that leap into the safer countries in the world. And you still see pockets in Southeast Asia where you see country risk. But that's essentially my way of estimating equity risk premiums. And I said, I need to think about these equity risk premiums when I do valuation. So when I value companies, and you'll see this through the year as I do valuations, here's what I will often do. If I think your risk comes from where you get your revenues, I'm going to break your revenues down by country or by region at least and take a weighted average of the equity risk premium to the countries you operate in. So to get an equity risk premium for Coca-Cola, I'm going to take a weighted average of the regions of the world Coca-Cola invests in rather than the equity risk premium for the U.S. And I will do the same thing when I'm valuing Tata Consulting Services or Embraer. We can no longer use just our local equity risk premiums in valuing local companies. And that's part of the reason I spent so much time 
and invest so many resources starting to come up with these equity risk premiums by country. So I hope you found this session to be useful in providing you at least with a sense of what you need to do when you're faced with country risk. Thank you very much for listening.